Hi, this is Steve Hodgson at Modern Asset Management. Here again today with Dion DiPioli of Secure Debt Exchange Systems. And we're gonna to talk today about another step in underwriting, which is understanding what's in a collateral file and what are the things you need to know to make sure that you're buying a good loan. Um, we're gonna understand assignments of mortgage and allonges and what uh, other collateral is in there. We're gonna go through a file that Modern owns and Dion's going to go through the underwriting steps that are necessary to make sure we're doing what we should be. All right, take it away. Hi, everybody. So let me get my screen up here. Okay, you see me? All right, so um, this particular file to get it with. Um, all right, I'm just trying to get some stuff in order here so I can see. All right, so um, just to kind of start off with, so when, when SDXS is engaged for due diligence, um, we get raw data from a seller. Um, so I'm going to show us a little bit of what that raw data looks like and then what we do to transition that into a file that the investor can, can work with. Um, so this, this particular uh, this particular set of assets was a, was a larger pool. So we received a lot of information from the seller. Um, and you know, some of that comes over in various pieces, whether it might be collateral files or, um, servicing information, accounting history, and so on and so forth. And so what we will do then is we go in and we aggregate that information into each individual loan file. And for this particular demonstration, we're gonna use this file here. So uh, the collateral file, you know, typically what, what'll happen is the, the seller will send over a collateral file and they can range in, in a variety of sizes. Um, this particular collateral file has 583 pages. So there's a lot of information in, in the PDF. Um, and what we do is we go through and sort through that and we pull out um, all of the documents that are um, important and noteworthy. And we have, um, we have a prop proprietary structure to our file. And so if, um, if you use us for, for due diligence, you'll, you'll always see our asset file set up like this, where we have a collateral folder, which is going to contain um, information about the, the mortgage note, title, um, and so on and so forth. Um, but before I go through that, uh, let me just point out that in every single file, there's this SDXS asset folder index. So um, if you didn't want to just click on stuff and see what was in it, you can actually open this up and it's a little index of what's in each folder. Um, it'll give you a little idea of, you know, what you're looking for. Um, so we have each of these, um, each of these files broken down. We have collateral, we have credit, which is going to be origination documentation. Um, we have a legal folder, which is going to include bankruptcy and foreclosure. If there is any, the folder is still there regardless of there being any legal proceedings. Um, a property folder, which will contain some, some property information. Um, and then the servicing folder, uh, which is sort of a, a, an ongoing um, compilation of what's been happening with servicing. And we'll, we'll, we'll dig into some of the details as we go through this. Um, and then what we also have is um, in every file, we have this digital asset, uh, asset data file. And so what this, what this does is this serves as a... Um, a, a quick look at the file, um, at the due diligence that was done. And so uh, it looks a lot like most of our other stuff that we publish, we've got a cover and we have the original data for the loan. Um, so we have everything that you'd expect, right? The address, borrower, original note information, current note information, um, and then further to the right will be a little bit more of the information that would be pertinent to uh, forbearance, modifications, foreclosure, and so on and so forth. And when we start due diligence, um, SDXS orders um, broker price opinions. Uh, we get those from a national vendor. 
that we've been working with for for many many years. We we have a lot of confidence in their in their output. Um, we also order title reports. Um, generally, um, those are owner and encumbrance reports. They go back to the last known owner, and that report will go over any um, the last ownership change and then any other liens or encumbrances that are affecting title. We'll take a look at that in just a second. So our, our first step is we'll order those vendor services and then we will actually start to sort the file. And so most of that is going to start to end up in, you know, what, what we're, what everybody seems to want to pay attention to is, is what ends up being in what uh, our collateral for. And so the collateral is going to be um, a deed of trust or a mortgage, the security instrument, depending on the state. So this particular asset has a deed of trust. Um, and just as a, as a side note here, deeds of trust and mortgages are instruments that get recorded. So um, be due to the nature of us ordering a title report and that title report verifying that the, the instrument was recorded, we don't necessarily have to um, have any um, undue concerns if the copy that we have is not doesn't have the recording stamp because once we see that it's recorded in our title report, that's it's the same document, right? So from there, uh, we'd look for the promissory note, which doesn't get recorded. Um, the promissory note is one of the is one of the, the few pieces of of documents that we actually need to ensure that we have an original. Um, and obviously, as a function of due diligence. Um, you can't really do that. Um, it's something that you're that you that you know the rubber meets the road once the file ships to you. Um, but if the note is missing, it's not the end of the world. Um, you can do lost note affidavits um, and then use copies of those as, as well. So th so the, the takeaway there is there's even though some things sort of break, if you will, um, or some things might be missing from files, there are procedures to handle any of those defects. That, um, that 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 cure the concerns that might be present um, with any particular yeah, investor. Yeah, let me just jump in here for a second. There's um, particularly if you're new, and this was my experience when I was new, is you don't know what's missing in a file, um, and you're told that, like you just said, well, you can you can overcome breaks in chain, and you can overcome a missing note, you can overcome a missing allonge, um, and yes, you can. Um, but sometimes you wind up having to pay a lot of money to an attorney to make an appearance to get things done. And, and I would think that you'd want to, part, uh, part of your work is making sure that you're as clean as can be on the way in. And we don't have to buy broken uh, loans. There's plenty of loans that aren't uh, damaged that can be bought. Yeah, so that's a good point. So um, let me come back to that because I'll show everybody again, a little bit of the process and, okay. and that gets us to that finish line prior to purchase. So, you know, the, so the point here is we, you know, we're going through the, the, the information that the seller provided us and we're pulling out things that um, are, are useful, which will, which will be all the collateral documents. And you see this, this particular file has a good set of collateral documents. So we've got a, a deed of trust. We've got a note. Um, we have, um, a, uh, we have writers and amendments that uh, were attached to the collateral documents. So we have a prepayment rider, we have an amendment to the note, uh, we have an adjustable rate rider, and then we also have a modification that took place on this loan at one point in time. And as a side note, you know, it's always, um, it's always a good idea to ensure that either the, uh, uh, the modification was recorded or that when you get one that you record it so that you give constructive notice. Um, and, and then you're also gonna ensure that you don't ever lose the modification. Um, so, uh, and then you're gonna have a title policy. In some files, you will end up with a title commitment and um, you can use the commitment to get a policy. Um, but you know, what, what you really are looking for is the, is the actual title commitment, at, at the very least the guts of it. And what happens is, is when the loan closes, you'll have the, the actual schedules that are inside the policy, and then there's a jacket that goes with it. And scrolling past the jacket, there's the jacket. So the jacket will, um, the jacket gives some other clauses and, and so on and so forth. But you wanna make sure that you have one of those two things um, to protect 
the, um, the, the superiority of the instrument that you're purchasing. So uh, we sort all of this out. And as we start to sort it out, we go back, we are ensuring that the data that was provided to us at bid is the data that is correctly coming from those documents. So for instance, the original note amount needs to be the original note amount from the note. Um, and then, so for instance, the model, you know, any modification data that was supplied needs to match up with the, the modification documents that are in the file as well. So um, kind of continuing through, um, we will go through and pull some of the credit file information. We don't overly segment this, so it really depends on um, what the seller's original file is. For this particular file, we, we, it, didn't, it didn't have a, a, a tremendous amount of credit documentation, but we have the original 1003, which is the borrower's uni uh, uniform residential loan application. So, you know, this is one of those things that it's, it's nice to have, you know, we knew, we, we get a glimpse of what the borrower is doing at the time of origination. Um, as with anything in life, whatever job they have could be changed, you know, they may have lost their job, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But this gives us a good idea of where they came from, what they were doing. This will also tell us a little bit about the, pur the purpose of the loan, right? So this particular loan was a refinance. Um, so we understand that, you know, they've, they've obviously been in this house for a little while, um, 1997. And um, that might give us insight into dealing with the bar. Um, in, in ongoing servicing once the loan's purchased. A 1008 is a, uh, trans, it's called a transmittal summary. It's used to take origination, the, the application information at origination and, and send it over to underwriting. Um, it's more of a summary page of what's going on with the borrower, what's supposed to be going on with the loan. Um, this particular file, where we had a flood certification, and then we had a Truth in Lending Act um, that was unexecuted. Um, normally not, very rarely are you ever gonna tap back into the, the, the credit file um, to use for anything in uh, foreclosure, defense. Um, you're not saying never, but very rarely. So there's, you know, you're usually not gonna go, go too far into the, the, the original credit because life's changed and um, provided you have a, a good standing security instrument and you're holding the note, that's really what the, you know, that's really what any debate's going to be about. Um, in this particular file, we didn't have any legal, um, any legal work. So there's nothing to talk about there. So, but you know, if, if there was any bankruptcy information or any foreclosure information, we, we drop it in there. Um, in, depending on the seller, you may have, um, you may have a series of property inspections, you might have a series of broker price opinions. Um, that have um, been ongoing since their ownership. So in this particular file, we can see that we have the original appraisal back from, um, back from origination. Again, one of those things nice to have, um, you know. Um, and then we had the sellers, uh, in this particular file, we had the seller's BPO, which was validating the, the BPO number that they gave us. And then this BPO report as of July um, was, was ours a, a, upon purchase. Um, Then we can kind of, then we can, the next folder down is, is our servicing folder. And servicing tends to be a, uh, a catch-all. Um, so you're gonna have correspondence that goes out to the borrower. Um, you're gonna have, um, we, we tend to put any insurance uh, information that's in there. So in this particular file, there was a, a lender place insurance letter that went out. Um, there was um, this particular file. We purchased this in July, and one month later, the um, homeowner's insurance was expiring, so we made note of that. Um, and then <clears throat> dating back to the modification that's in place, this was the original proposed terms that went on to, uh, that went over to the, the borrower before the modification was uh, entered into. <laughs> These um, added authorities were um, a situation with this particular borrower um, where they had, um, where the daughter was put on um, and, and, and added to be able to deal with the account in absence of her father um, from, from being able to communicate with the servicing company. So as we sort through all of that, we kind of get it into our, our own little buckets. 
um, then we really start digging into the file. So we get so 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 it's organized. We understand what's there, and with that organization, we also uh, we also begin to identify what's missing, um, and we'll start to take notes. And that's really at this point in, uh, at this point in the process is really when the asset data file will start to take some um, some meaningful structure. Um, and so what we'll what we'll generally start by doing is is grabbing all the servicing notes, which you see a copy of the servicing notes here. Um, you may also find an independent copy in the servicing folder, but it's, it's here again for the quick reference. Um, and we will then start reviewing the servicing notes. This particular set of servicing notes um, goes back probably a year or so. Yeah, a couple years. So three years, right, 2016 to 2013. So we'll kind of go through this and, and you know, reading through the servicing notes, uh, you know, takes a little bit of time, but it gives you a good idea of what's been going on. Um, what the file might be able to give you some disposition ideas that you could glean. Um, so for instance, as I just explained that we, you know, we saw in the servicing folder that they were adding, um, they're adding an additional uh, uh, account uh, bearer to be able to deal with the servicer. This is the daughter called in um, with authorization because the father's in Mexico and she wants to be able to pay and deal with the, the servicer um, as necessary in his absence. Um, so they provided her with a form to do so. And then she then can help service the account, which is obviously in everybody's best interest, right? So um, from time to time, when we go through these servicing notes, we may, this particular one doesn't have much because there wasn't really, um, there wasn't a lot of trouble in this, in this account. Um, but if we go through some stuff and we see concerning comments, um, the borrower's doing something or something's missing in servicing, we may go ahead and highlight that independent um, cell so that as a quick reference for you, for you as the investor, as you come back and you're scrolling through this, you know, maybe you haven't had to touch the file in a couple months, um, it'll, give you a, it'll give you a little scroll and you can kind of say, oh yeah, okay, now I'm starting to remember what was going on in this file, which, which happens for us all the time, right? So you, you know, one, one you, you bought the loan um, and then it's four or five months later, there's, you know, a bump in the road and you got to revisit and remind yourself who is it, you know, what was going on, what were some of the issues and um, so that this serves as sort of a quick reference guide. As we're going through that, we will develop our own commentary, which ends, which ends up sort of serving as direction to the particular investor. Um, and so oftentimes when, when, when I go back through these, I immediately just turn to our comments and go, what's the snapshot of what was going on when this, with this loan when we bought it? Again, this is a pretty, pretty easy breezy file. They've been paying, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of turmoil here. So, um, you know, we, we made note that there's some, uh, an excessive amount of judgments. Uh, daughter was added to the account. Um, they've been paying on time. They have a substantial amount of equity and they have, you know, a, a decent term left. So all in all, this was, this was really a, you know, pretty, pretty decent loan. Um, <clears throat> In situations where the loan may have uh, a little bit more hair on it, we'll have a lot more detailed notes, and we may we may address particular disposition strategies or concerns. So, if this was a non-performing loan, if there were liens and encumbrances on title, we may we may address those and talk about um, briefly talk about what you, as the investor, should be concerned with if you were to pursue some of those strategies. Um, so, I'm going to pause there with 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 this, and I'm gonna go back to the folder um, so that we can start to take a look at the title report, which is um, something I know everybody likes to, uh, likes to take a peek at. So this particular vendor, this was uh, Nationwide Title Clearing, one of the vendors that we use, we also use ProTitle. Um, so when we get this, uh, when we get this owner and commerce report, what, what it's gonna tell us is who the, um, who the property is currently vested in, right? So this is our borrower. So this should match who's on the note mortgage. Um, obviously, the property address should be right. Um, you know, get, they'll generally give us some some tax information, which is um, going to be current tax information, and aggregate back through any delinquent tax information. 
Um, so I know a lot of folks go and spend a bunch of time, you know, rummaging through county websites and so on and so forth. Uh, we generally don't do that. We generally rely on our O&E report to just tell us what, what the back taxes are. Um, so it's, you know, pretty simple. I'm a big fan of not doing things twice. Um, so, so in this particular case, you know, this, this account was being handled pretty well by uh, apparently the daughter. Um, this deed information is the, the sale. So this is how our borrower came into ownership of it. So the grantor um, was the one who sold it to our borrower, who is the grantee. Um, and obviously at one point in time here, there was, um, there was a marriage scenario that, that needed to be addressed um, that doesn't create any, any issues for us. Um, and I'm not going to go through every particular scenario here, but um, I think one of the most controversial ideas is when we get into the chain of ownership of the mortgage itself. And so um, before I go through that, for those people that want to um, do a little light reading, um, on our website, which I have posted over here, we have a we have a blog portion of our website, which has a couple articles on it. I was trying to write some more, but I get a little sidetracked. Uh, anyhow, there is a article that I wrote um, a little while ago that's called Assignments and Endorse Endorsements. And it's a uh, endorsements is uh, an endorsement is what you're actually doing to the note. An assignment is what you do to the security instrument. And endorsements that are on separate pieces of paper are called allonges. Um, so an endorsement, <clears throat> um, which we'll take a look at this one too to see if there's an example, but what, um, allonges didn't come around until the late 1980s and they were a function of securitization. Um, so uh, an allonge, you know, everybody uses the term an allonge. That's really just a pay to the order of. It's the same thing that you write on the back of a check, um, you know, when, when you endorse that check. So that's the same endorsement. But po point of the matter here is this article has some pretty substantial details, pretty, you know, it's pretty lengthy on what the important ideas are when it comes to the nature of an endorsement and the nature of an assignment, what it does, what it doesn't do. Um, what you should be concerned about. So if you have some time, you're curious about it, um, give it a give it a read. It's, it's out there on our website, uh, www.sdxs.us. Mortgage taboo uh, uh, assignments and endorsements. So so now we're going back to the um, the chain of assignments uh, for this particular loan. We will take the um, title report. And we will actually summarize that for the sake of the investor into the asset data file. And that is the summary ownership. Um, so this summary ownership is going to, see if I can be a little slick here, there we go. Um, so this summary ownership is going to be um, exactly in line with what we have on the left for the mortgage information. So we see the originating lender was New Century Mortgage. Um, the mortgage is, it, since that's the lender, that's it's we're not looking for an assignment because that's they're the one that's actually in the security instrument itself. Um, this particular mortgage uh, was a mortgage made by New Century with a nomination to Mears Mortgage Electronic Registration System, um, and a lot of controversies about Mears. Maybe one at some other time, maybe we can talk a little bit more about Mears, but. Um, Mears acts as an agent for the mortgagee, um, and so they do have power to assign out um, the, 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 the legal interest of the loan. And so what we're looking for here as we go through this is that the lender was New Century. <clears throat> Mears then assigned out the, um, the loan to Residential Funding Corporation. And what you can see over here, um, I don't know if my video stuff is in the way, but um, we have one column that's talking about whether or not the AOM is recorded and another column on whether or not there is an accompanying allonge or endorsement. Um, so you'll note that Mears has a recorded assignment, 
which coincides with our title report right here. Um, but it doesn't have an accompanying allonge. And that's because Mears doesn't have an equitable interest in the loan. They cannot assign or endorse the loan to, they, I'm sorry, they cannot endorse the loan to anybody else. They can certainly sign. Um, so the next party of both with both legal and equitable interest was residential um, funding corporation. And we made, um, we made note of the defect of, of the lack of recording of this assignment. Um, and we did have the um, allowance to correspond. And then RWS um, from RWLS four or nine holdings or whatever the hell that is for, um, took in an assignment as a corrective intervening instrument because of the lack of this recorded AOM. So in other words, what happened here was New Century made the loan, put it with mirrors, Residential Funding Corporation at one point in time owned the loan. Uh, that, AOM, that AOM was never uh, recorded, might have been lost because it wasn't recorded, which wasn't unusual back in the day. Um, and as such, the, the seller to us uh, went back to Mears, got a new assignment um, that, uh, that you're sort of skipping over Residential Funding Corporation. Um, and it consolidates, you're still consolidating the ownership into RWLs, so it still gives them standing. Um, and so that was, that was a corrective instrument that resolves the, tr the chain. There's different ways to do that depending on how dirty or whatever's going on with the chain. But as we kind of go through this, we look for that. And then what happens here is for, for us in our um, due diligence, as we complete this due diligence, we create... Um, with the seller, what's called a stipulation list. And so it's in, in, uh, in a full sentence, it is stipulations to close. And so for this particular loan, we would have stipped for anything that was missing. We would have said a condition for us to buy this loan would have been, we need to get this a launch. We need to get this uh, assignment. Um, and I can give you, a, I can just kind of show you an example of that for this particular pool. <clears throat> And just to jump in, the yeah. the real reason that this is important is if you go to foreclose, that you don't have standing to execute on the property unless it's been assigned to you in proper fashion and the chain is complete. Um, because of all the robo-signing stuff that was going on in the early 2000s, all the local courts are really, really... Uh, pay attention to this and I'm very happy to kick you out. Um, you the bad guy, you the bad guy um, to protect their local voting constituent uh, who's there saying that these people don't have the right to take my home from me. And it's a big deal to take somebody's home. And so you make sure that you're doing everything you're supposed to and you shouldn't buy anything that you can't execute on. This is, you can buy unsecured, that would mean you're just buying an unsecured loan. Yeah, so, you know, just to add to that idea a little, Steve, so um, uh, depending on the counterparty that you're interfacing with and the quality of file, um, you generally wouldn't, you, you know, look, there's, there's always going to be stuff missing. And so, you know, what I have up on my screen right now, um, and just to kind of explain this workbook, this is, this, was the, this is the pool workbook, right? So we do everything from a pool and then we break into the, the individual loan. So this is all the aggregated data that um, came through on the pool. You know, we had a list of missing documents, um, original, uh, we had original bids to the seller, updated data from the seller, um, because there's usually a gap between the bid data and the due diligence data. Uh, this is all the BPO data. This is all of the comment history for all of the loans in the entire pool. Um, and then this is our stip list for <laughs> for this trade, um, and uh, you know, and I think it's I I, I, I giggle because I, I don't think a lot of buyers out there actually get to this, right? I think they just kind of take the file and and they're done. Um, and you know, look, we 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 had to go back to the seller and we had to stip for all kinds of stuff. You know, we were missing uh, forced place insurance. We needed things that need we needed stuff to be explained to us that was in the file for accounting. Uh, we had some AOMs that were missing. Um, this is, you know, we, we put it over in one nice complete list and we say, solve all this to our liking and then we'll, we'll, we'll you know, proceed to 
settlement. Um, and, and that's really the cycle that we go through. We, we bid, we get an award, we go through due diligence, the, the output of that due diligence um, are stipulations to the seller to complete, um, to complete funding. Um, and then once those stipulations are met, then you start moving through um, the settlement process, which is reviewing the contract and setting up final pricing and so on and so forth. So you can see, that's, yeah, that's a lot like, you know, you're going to go by, think about this, you're buying a house and you go through a house and you have a, you have a list of things you want the seller to do in order for you to buy the house. Uh, so much of the stuff traded in the marketplace, particularly the lower bandwidth is sold as is, where it is with no, uh, with no representations or warranties or very limited guarantees. And that's, I'm hearing, I hear that at paper source conferences and meetups where people, you know, they can't believe the problems that they're trying to dig out when the seller told them, oh, it's all okay. And that is all okay for the experienced uh, note investor who will discount the note, knowing that he's going to have to climb through a bunch of, jump through a bunch of hoops to get the, to get it done. Um, but it's certainly not a place I think for you know, me when I was brand new, um, it was, it was a big problem with my first note. Yeah. No, that, and that's, that's, that's very true. You know, what, what tends to happen in some of these lower level trades or, you know, um, lower bandwidth street, you know, street level trades is these files have been skinny down so much. They've traded, they traded, they've traded, they keep getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. Um, and you, you get to a point where there's just not the right stuff's not in it anymore. Um, and this is one of those cases where, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that you see here is stuff that we're asking for that would be from current servicing. Um, but as an example, in this, in this actual trade, um, these were three loans that we, we had to actually um, deal with differently because they were owner financing. Um, two of them got kicked out because of due diligence. We actually didn't settle on them because they were not able to meet the stipulations that we put forth. Um, and as such, we, did, we didn't buy them. You know, we, we gave the seller an opportunity to cure the defect. The seller couldn't cure the defect. Um, and so they got, they got kicked out. And so as, a, as another example, um, you know, here's a, you know, again, we, you know, we highlight stuff so that it's obviously easy to see. Um, in this particular, this particular loan file, uh, we, had, we had a defective AOM chain that we addressed and the seller was unable to, to deal with it um, on the first go around. And so we had to continue to work on this. So it's sometimes it's not as, you know, I make it sound like it's, hey, you give them a list and everything gets solved. That's, that's not always the way it goes. Um, you know, you, you generally want to put on to this, you generally want to have the seller be responsible for providing you with everything that is necessary for you to take proper legal and equitable ownership of the loan. Um, and you don't want to be the, the, you don't want to be the party that they tell you, well, you're going to have to go you know, chase all that stuff down. You don't want to do that. Um, you know, especially if it's an institutional guy, if it's an institutional guy, they're going to have better connections than you to be able to go track down AOMs or get things signed by parties that you have no idea who they are that are more than likely out of business for several years. Um, so you put it on them, make it a condition of, of, um, uh, purchasing the loan. And if they can't meet it, then you just don't buy it. And you know, that's, that's, you, you have to be disciplined with, with that idea. Um, you know, just like a lender is disciplined with, um, you know, requirements from, from any particular borrower in terms of income, asset, down payment, you know, if those things aren't met, you don't, you know, they don't, they don't get the money, you know, and that's, and, and that's that. And if you stick to that disciplined approach, you, you don't have to sweat this stuff, right? So, you know, we, we, we bought all of these loans, um, and all of this is, all of this is in the past. We don't go back to this stuff, Right. Um, you know, there's, there's always a little rigmarole as the transaction closes in terms of getting, you know, some of the newer AOMs over into your file and then out for recording. And sometimes there's some uh, clerical errors and stuff like that. But, um, you know, once you get past that, it's gone. It's, you know, you, it's, you're, you're moving forward. You know, you don't want to sweat this stuff. It's, it's more, it's difficult enough to deal with a borrower and, and a distressed loan. You don't want to be having to go back and, you know, touch AOM chains and deal with, you know, all of that potential headache. So, um, 
So I'll just leave that down for a second. So let's go back to this particular file. Um, so so um, real quick before I leave the title report, th th there's, a, there's some other, um, there's some other niceties to some of these O&E reports. Um, generally what will happen is, you know, no matter who your vendor is, they're going to give you some sort of summary report in front of the actual documents, right? So we've got a copy of the deed. Um, we've got a copy of um, the disclaimer deeds. There's going to be a copy of the actual recorded mortgage in here. Um, so uh, any, all of the recorded AOMs. And so what you'll see when we go through our file, just as, a, as an example, um, I don't know what that was doing. So we go back through our file. You'll see that in our collateral folder, we have this subfolder called assignments and allonges. And you know, the allonges are gonna be the allonge chain that we were documenting over here. But you know, sometimes we'll have one single AOM file with um, a couple pages in it, maybe we will have several AOMs. Um, but for for us, this is this is this isn't that important because um, I'm not overly concerned if we have a digital copy of it. I'm concerned if it shows up on our title report, right? So um, because if it's not showing up on our title report, it's not stamped. It was never recorded. And that's my concern, right? So there's a great example, right? So here's a copy that's recorded, right? There's a stamp. And here's a copy that isn't, right? So if this is sitting in file, that doesn't give me any peace of mind until such time as I see it over here in the title report and I can validate that it's recorded. And adversely, when we have defects in those chains, we, you know, we, we have to do this, you know, every so often because the, your, your title report providers are human too. They may miss stuff. And so, you know, when I look at a chain and I'm like, well, wait a minute, I've, I've got that recorded. I've got a copy of that recorded AOM right here. You send it back over to the, the title company and you say, hey, look, this is missing from the report. It's obviously recorded. It's obviously a part of the chain. Please update the report and send it back. You know, that kind of stuff happens. You also do that same kind of, you know, shuffle back and forth with the seller too, right? Well, they'll be like, hey, look, you know, it's recorded. Somebody screwed up on your guys' side. Um, but, but, but the takeaway here is what you find in our file when we go through this, and I think a lot of buyers make this mistake, is that they go start looking through the data that the, that the seller gave as if that's the data that matters. That's not the validation data. The validation is the title report. This is just uh, nice to have, right? Um, the allonges, that, so the allonges, we do want to make sure that we have copies of because these are, these are what are necessary. Um, these don't get recorded. These should be in file, so on and so forth. And um, just as a pre, just as another example, let me see if I can poke at one generically and uh, see if there was a, I want to give an example of an, of an actual endorsement. There it is. So this is an endorsement. This is an endorsement. You won't find the lunges because they're on the note. And to be honest with you, that's the preferred method, right? Technically speaking, you don't have to make an allonge. You can just put pay to the order of on the note. And the beauty of that is you won't ever lose the endorsement because it's always on the note because you shouldn't lose the note, right? So this is an example of the endorsement. And if we were to look at this particular file since we're here, um, can't open both, both, both. Since they're, oh, they're named the same, I have to close that one. Um, so if we look at our ownership summary, um, we marked it. Well, sometimes I'll mark it and say endorsement and sometimes, so I'll, I'll, I'll mark it as an endorsement on, on the note. But in this particular case, actually, now that I'm looking at this and we look back at the, the note, uh, that's the title report. I closed the note. Yeah, I, got a lot, I got a little on a tangent here, but I, I want to make this point because, again, I think some of the stuff is confusing to folks. This, these endorsements may not coincide with an actual assignment. Okay, so let me say that again. 
So Steve can own a loan and he can endorse the note to me. And so what the endorsement's doing is it's assigning the, the cash flow, the equitability of, of the loan to me. For, so, so maybe he's using the loan as collateral, which is you know, used very often. That's, that's, that's done very often. So Steve isn't relinquishing ownership. He's assigning the cash flow to me. And you do that through an endorsement or an allonge. Right. So and that's called, and when I would sell a partial, that's how you do that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So if you, yeah, if you, well, sort of, no. all right, yeah. we'll come back to that. Some, some no, way some other time. <laughs> yeah, right. um, but so, so th th this form, especially, you know, with, um, you know, conventional loans, this is, this is very common, right? This was very common because they were swapping money back and forth. They were, you know, um, uh, they were syndicating some of these notes with, with other investors and so on and so forth. However, so, so, so you can have a, you can have an endorsement, um, or, or an assignment, uh, you can have an endorsement without there being an assignment, but you can't have an assignment without there being an endorsement. In other words, um, you, there should be an accompanying, you, you're going to legally transfer the loan. I'm going to legally transfer the loan to Steve. I need to also give Steve that same equitability. Now in theory, once you read the article that I, I mentioned, there's some ideas there that I'm cleaning that up because if you legally own the loan, it's like legally owning the property, a piece of real property, um, and you give a tenant the, the equitable right of possession, you still legally own the property and you can take back that equitability of possession at some point. Um, but so that's sort of the general idea, right? It has to do with um, the series of rights that go along with the, with the instrument. So, okay, so getting a little off. Yes, we, yes, we are. Let's, uh, yeah, let's, we'll let's come back. Going. Yeah. All right. So, um, you know, uh, last couple things here that, that we kind of go through, um, and I guess we'll just use this one. Since we're in. Um, so, so again, so I don't really know what's going on in this file. We'll, we'll have it looked at here in a second. So we kind of dig into our comments. Um, so this guy had uh, incons inconsistent pay histories, divorcing his wife, uh, lots of debt on the subject of property, minor repairs noted. Um, went through a modification, and then here's us giving some disposition advice. Um, and so the, so the one part that we didn't get to kind of dig into was the accounting history. Um, and, y y you know, you should get accounting history even with, the defaulted loans. And I think, you know, we, we do a lot of work with investors post purchase. Um, they come to us and they have us do some due diligence on some stuff that they bought because they want to know what to do with it and want to make sure that they didn't get, um, that they didn't buy a lemon. Um, you should always have an accounting history, right? So even if a loan is not performing, there's still accounting that's taking place because advances are being made and so on and so forth. So um, this is what, so, so this is the accounting history for this, for this loan, right? And um, we can see that there's, there, you know, there's payments, we've got a due date, we've got when the actual payment was done. We do these calculations, we set these calculations up so they're easy to read. Um, and then how those are applied to the account. Um, and <laughs> you know what'll be a good little example here, Steve, now that we're thinking about it, your friend and mine, the bankruptcy file. Oh yes. <laughs> Um, so this is a good example just to kind of give you an idea of, of why it's important to get this information. Um, this loan was in bankruptcy and, um, upon our acquisition, um, we understood that there was funds that were being held in. So this, this just has some ongoing work from, from Dion because we had to get to the bottom of some stuff. Um, we had some, we had some money sitting in what's called unapplied. So in other words, um, money had came in, um, from the bankruptcy trustee and it wasn't being applied to the account. Um, that was exciting upon acquisition because when you buy the loan, you also buy those, those funds that are sitting in unapplied because you can't, unless that, unless those funds can't be released, unless they are, uh, unless they advance the payment date to the benefit of the borrower. Um, so they would transfer to the new owner. So long story short, we had a very 
um, knock down, drag out um, fight over this loan because the servicer that was working on this loan for the seller um, during our interim servicing period, uh, which is the period of time after the actual, you know, settlement before our servicer takes over, um, they treated this loan unilaterally. They made advances that were outside of um, bank standard bankruptcy procedures. They applied funds to release them um, to their advantage. And um, we had to go back through this. Uh, this took me, I don't know, what, three, four months, right? Four months, and, yeah. yeah, four months. We had to go back through this, as, as you see by the, the, the nature of that, of this uh, file, BK loan mistreatment. We had to go through this accounting, I had to go through this accounting and go knock on the door multiple times to get um, to get a resolution, which was, you know, this what you're seeing here was, like you guys, uh, the way that the servicer treated the loan changed the value of the loan for us. And so that ended up being either A, buy the loan back from us, right? So it's important to have those reps and warrants in your, in your contract because this wasn't the seller doing this, this was their servicer. Um, and, or give us the difference, you know, make us whole with, with, you know, since your service are screwed up, this is the nature, this was the state of the loan. Um, if I were reverse engineer it back to purchase, this is the state of the loan and you owe us some, some money. So, um, uh, you know, the takeaway here is, you know, always get your, your accounting history, you know, even in a non-performing loan, um, for those that, that don't, you know, think about that too much. When you go to get your judgment, when you, you know, when you're filing for your, your, your judgment, you're actually standing in front of the, the, the you know, the, the court or the referee or the trustee. And you're saying, this is what's owed to me. And if you can't prove that, if that gets challenged and you can't prove that, you're not going to get to claim those, those funds. And, and um, you know, so, so the, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll put that into the idea that a lot of sellers will put the total due into their bid data and they'll try to force um, street level buyers to, uh, to sort of level up based on, well, look at how much is totally due. The total due is not the same as what the judgment's going to be. And so, you know, when, when sellers come to us with that kind of stuff, I'm, I, I usually knock it down within 10 seconds because unless you're gonna prove all of that up front, I'm not using that. The one number that we're gonna use is the unpaid principal balance. I'm not going to use this total due because you could have mowed the loan a hundred times. You may not have all those invoices and I may not be able to claim those funds or the loan where you may be just making advances on your own ignorantly, Mr. Seller, and your attorney is over in left field filing for, you know, a sum that is different than what your total due is. So the, so the point of the matter is those things don't always add up and it's important to have, accounting history on defaulted loans is, is just as much as it is important to have accounting history well, on and, and in, that, loans. in that bankruptcy, we thought the loan balance was what the seller thought the loan balance was and what their servicer said the loan balance was. And when we boarded it at Security National, they went through all that diligence work of recalculating it and looking into the bankruptcy record and seeing if the loan had been changed a bit and that payments and it was it was it was like i said it was it was months to get it sorted out um because of choosing the right uh, counterparty to buy from um, and your relationship with them they they made it good yeah they made it good and the borrower was making his payments like he's supposed to and and to his benefit the balance was reduced what, about 25 percent. yeah yeah it was yeah. a lot yeah, yeah. And so he's got what, like another ten thousand dollars, and he owns his house outright. Yeah, this was a this was a, um, a, a a terminating bankruptcy plan. So there is no more loan after the bankruptcy plan is over. Mm -hmm. And that was the issue. That was the, that was the treatment issue. Um, that that when they applied the funds, they weren't applying it like that. So this this bankruptcy plan pays the loan to zero. Um, okay, so I think so. We went through. We went through, I think, darn near everything. Um, 
What do you think? Uh, you have any questions that, that you don't think we addressed here, Steve? Uh, I think we've walked through. I think we've walked through the. Uh, oh, well, let's go back to. What do I when something's missing? Mm -hmm. How do I know that it's okay that that's missing? Because I'm you know, after after my first experience of having something that was not okay after being told it was okay. I was missing. I was that was missing. There were unrecorded breaks in the chain. There were, there were, so that that was that was a big deal. Um, some things are curable and some things aren't. Um, is missing. Um, there was a time that you'd simply just type up an affidavit and stamp it and it'd be good. Um, courts don't take that anymore. Um, what do I have to have? What do I absolutely have to have? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, you, here's what you have to have. You, you have to have, and I'm going to just open up a file here. We'll leave, we'll leave Mr. Baldwin alone. He gets picked on a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you have to have a recorded security instrument. So it's going to be a deed of trust or a mortgage. You have to have that, right? If you don't have it recorded, you don't have you don't have any idea of what your of what your actual standing is. It doesn't mean that it's invalid. It just means that you're going to have to fight a lot over somebody who's going to say, "What are you talking about? I'm in first position." You're going to be like, "No, I'm not." You know, so um, so you want to you, you want a recorded security instrument. You're going to validate that through your title report. Um, you want an original note um, and. Uh, the original note is going to be in your file. You're not going to be able to, to, to have peace of mind that it's actually the original until you put your hands on it post post settlement. But um, you know, when you're doing, when you're purchasing the loan, you need to, you know, make sure that that's a stipulation in your contract that it says the original note, right? It doesn't say a copy of the note. Um, if there is a copy of the note, it needs to, or if the original note is missing, I should say, um, then that needs to accompany, be accompanied by a lost note affidavit, which is a lost note affidavit is a legal instrument that is created by the, by the entity and person who lost the original note and says, hey, I, I had it in my hand, I lost it, I affirm I lost it, and here's an exact copy of it, um, and here's my sworn statement. And then that turns into the usable promissory note moving forward. Um, so those are the those are the two things. Um, and then you want to have um, you know you, you're going to want to have any title. Uh, you really want to have a title policy, as I had, I had said before, right? So this is this is the title policy that is ensuring the lender's lien position becomes very valuable if somebody steps forward and says, no, 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 I'm in I'm in first position, um, and um, yeah, so you want you want the, the the title policy. If you don't have the policy, you can use the commitment. It has a number. So this is the, so this is both documents. This actually this particular document has both the commitment and the policy in it. Sometimes we'll just group them up. Easy easy to keep track of. Um, and then if there's a modification, you need the copy of the modification for you know you, you you can't live up to terms on something that you don't have a document that's executed. Preferably, these are recorded. Um, this particular seller didn't record them. Some, some institutional folks don't. Um, but when you get these, you, you really should record them. If you have a loan that is modified and it falls into default and you're going to go through some legal proceedings, your attorney will probably tell you to record the modification before they file any complaint or, or move forward with the legal process. Um, so, so as far, so, so then, um, again, as we talked about with the, the AOMs, you don't necessarily have to have those in the file. You have to have those in your title report. And anything that you can't link up your title report to, you need to go back to the cell and put it on them. And you know, and look, it's when you go through these chains, they're, I, I, you know, they become a little. I guess, you know, I guess I'm a little immune to it because I've been looking at you know chains of title for a very long time. But when you go through these, it, it's you know, it's a, it's really a situation where. Um, it goes from one party to the next, you know, it should be, you know, party A then sells to party B and party B sells to party C and it's, it should be a successive chain of title. And that's why we do that ownership summary um, so that it's easy for people to understand. Sometimes we'll abbreviate names because they can be pretty long. And I think a lot of times what, what, what messes people up with, with the assignment chains is, is when things get put into securities 
and you know un understand that you know loans are you know 80 percent of the loans in the conventional market were put in a security at one point in time so they're held in a trust and that trust is uh managed by you know u.s national bank or pnc or you know pick 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 somebody um but it's it's in a trust and and you know that it comes out of the trust because it fell into default um, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where it starts to get a little confusing. Um, but you really should be able to go through your, your title report and one by one, you know, if you, if you do it, you know, I, I guess you just do it like we do it, right. You know, make a line, say, this is where I started. I started with a lender. Who did it go to next? Do I have that? Is that assignment recorded? And if you don't, and that's where you'll see that you have a broken chain. If, if the lender, you know, if you, if, if you've got a lender and then all of a sudden you've got this other, weird third party um you know that's that that you don't have an assignment that's recorded or you have this trailing assignment copy that's sitting in your file that's not going to be sufficient so get so again the, the the copy of the aom in your file really is is meaningless right so if we saw that we'd go back to the center and be like hey find that original get it recorded because now you need to tell the county that that is an intervening assignment. That assignment belongs somewhere back in time um, in order for the, for the chain to, to, to be properly, um, to be in proper um, hierarchy, I guess is the right way right. Uh, to say that. Um, and then you need to have your, you know, you need to have your uh, original assignment or uh, 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 um, endorsements or allonges. Um, again, those are those are extensions of the note so it kind of falls under the same idea you really don't have peace of mind um knowing that those are all present until you get your file um and and so the one thing that you need to have the physical document for is going to be the note all of its endorsements and all of its assignments that's that's really the one thing that needs to be in in the file everything else um, can be in digital format, right? right. Because um, you can, if, if, if a mortgage is missing in your seller's file, you can use a copy, you can get a certified copy from any county that it's, you know, from the uh, county it's recorded in. So it's, it's not gone. You know, the, the benefit of having it recorded is, um, is it's there forever. And, and on the recorded documents, it's the, the system of record is not your folder, it's not your file, it's what's, it's what's at the county. Right. So right. you can right. you can always go to the county and pay two dollars a page or wherever that local county charges and reconstruct it. But it's the it's the stamped copy that makes a difference. Otherwise, you don't have standing. Yeah, you could almost go so far as to say a recorded AOM, you know, no longer has a utility, right? Because it's recorded. It's doing what it it's it, it, it it's now done its constructive notice. Right. Utility. You know, having it in your hand is of no consequence once it's of, of public record. Um, and, and so that's so that, so that's really it. Everything else can be d digitized. Um, knowing what you have to ask for, and um, you know, you know, you, 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 you want to have accounting history so that you can support the claims for what's due underneath the note. Um, you want to have the the, the note and the allonges and, 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 and in some cases, right? So um, in some cases you can even argue um, a broken chain of assignments provided you're holding the note. Yeah. Shocking. I know it's in the article. Um, hmm. But so, uh, you know, that's, that's the, you know, that's the critical piece of, of information. Everything else is, is some of these is, is, is sort of stuff that's nice to have, but look, you know, legal file information, bankruptcy foreclosures, you can get that stuff. You know, you can get it from the, the, the attorney. You can get bankruptcy information from PACER. Um, original credit information isn't really changing the world. Um, you know, every once in a while, there's a, there's a situation where you might, you might be asked to produce a HUD or, um, you know, a closing statement. They're few and far between, so I don't really want to dig too far into that. Um, so and, and the rest of it's really just, you know, just diligence data, right? Due diligence data, you know, property information, servicing information, so on and so forth. Right. All right. Let's bring this thing to a close. Um, why don't you go back to your web browser there and open up your homepage so people know where to get a hold of you. Uh, the contact us tab, maybe. Uh, or you can go to the contact us tab.
No? That's, that's not me. That's not you. That's not me either. <laughs> that guy doesn't work for us. So, um, um, I don't know okay. there it goes. So you can you can reach out to us here or or my email is Dion at at stxs.us and Steve is Steve. Apparently I can't type. Steve at modern asset management. I should have just said it and not actually done this. <laughs> yeah, you can stop typing now. We're not going to get anywhere. Um, so it's Dion at sdxs.us, and it's Steve at modernassetmanagement.com. And we're here to help you buy notes, solve problems with uh, existing loans. To uh, We're looking for partners to join us in purchases. We have uh, access to um, what we think is is better quality paper than what we see at some of the larger places. And we're looking to build a tribe of uh, like-minded folks and we hope you reach out to us. All right, so uh, I wanna thank you all for your time today and we'll see you the next time. Thanks. <laughs>